everyone, and welcome to the Master Series, your guide to intelligent production, brought to you by Entertainment Partners. I'm your host, Natalie Nelson. In the Master Series, we focus on important issues impacting the entertainment industry and its workers through in-depth discussions with legal, tax, payroll, technology, and production experts. And today, we are pleased to present a special conversation with the Georgia Department of Revenue, answering frequently asked questions about the Georgia incentive and the audit process. Two quick housekeeping items as we get started today. First, we encourage you to join the conversation by posting questions in the Q&A section of the Zoom call. You can do so by clicking the Q&A icon in the Zoom navigation menu, and we'll do our best to save time after our discussion to answer your questions. Also, please take a few short minutes to answer a short feedback survey after today's webinar. This includes an opportunity for you to give us feedback as well as suggest topics for future webinars. Your feedback is very important to us and we thank you for it. Now I'm pleased to introduce you to today's panelists. Today we are joined by Brian Shanahan, Audits Manager at the Georgia Department of Revenue. Based in Los Angeles, as Audit Manager at the Georgia DOR, Brian's primary focus is conducting incentive audits in accordance with the Georgia Entertainment Industry Investments. He has over 30 years of multi-state tax experience in a public accounting, private industry, venture capitalism, and government roles. And our guest moderator today is Melissa Weissman, Director of Tax Credit Placement and Incentives here at Entertainment Partners. Melissa has over 20 years of experience specific to production accounting and incentives. Throughout her career, she has worked in all major production incentive states, gaining knowledge in the top filming locations in the U.S. While at EP, she has managed over $400 million in tax credits for her clients, and she currently leads EP's tax credit placement business, facilitating the sale of transferable film tax credits. She also serves as vice chair of the Institute of Professionals in Taxation's Committee for the 2023 Credits and Incentives Symposium. Melissa and Brian, it is so nice to have you with us today. Thank you for joining us. It's nice to see you. And good nice morning and good afternoon. <laughs> yes. Well, um, thanks, Natalie, for your wonderful welcome. And thanks to all of our viewers today. But I want to especially thank Brian Shanigan for being here to help us navigate through these new Georgia audits. I had this idea when I had to call Brian with an issue I had on a certificate um, number for a recent audit. And I thought, we need to clarify some things for our industry here. So in the spirit of making all of our jobs easier, we needed this interview. Typically we have our economic development partners, you know, on these webinars. And I'm so delighted to have more of a technical webinar with the Department of Revenue side of things. Um, and, you know, before we dive into incentive audit questions and, you know, the how to's and where to find things, what I wanted to do was start with the basics and where to get started. So Natalie, if you could share that slide, if you don't mind. Um, what I'm sharing at, right now is just the basics of the incentive. So Georgia has a base credit of 20% transferable tax credit with a 10% uplift for the Georgia Entertainment Promotion Incentive. Basically, that means using a logo or an alternative marketing opportunity to get that extra 10%. Um, there aren't a lot of caps or thresholds when it comes to the Georgia incentive. There is a minimum spend requirement of $500,000, and there's a $500,000 compensation cap, but that's only applicable to W-2 employees. And the slide that Natalie is sharing and that we have as a takeaway today what we are sharing is actually EP's incentive breakdown that we provide for our paying clients. So we go, you can always go to our website, ep.com slash incentives and find the information there. Um, but what I wanted to show is that, you know, if you hire us to manage this incentive for you, you know, this is just a snippet of our document of the deep dive that we go into for our clients and acclimate the producers, the accountants, the studio execs, all stakeholders, you know, we want to make sure that they are well aware of that incentive. So, you know, in 2020, the rules changed uh, and some of the biggest takeaways I wanted Brian to highlight before we get into our Q&A. So, Brian, please take it away. 
Sure. Thank you so much. Uh, you know, you made mention earlier about uh, Department of Economic Development uh, as a participant in, in the film tax credits and the, in their film tax audit there, or film tax office. And with any credit in gar regarding the film tax credits in the state of Georgia, that's where all the productions have to start. They have to go to the Department of Economic Development and get certified for the production in order to qualify for the credit. And the Department of Economic Development issues those uh, certificates. And in addition to that, they're responsible for verifying the 10% uplift that you had previously mentioned. So when all that information is generated and the production receives their certificate, that is the information they would bring to the Department of Revenue in order to start the process of qualifying their credit and obtaining their credit that is either transferable or can be consumed by themselves. And the big thing is, is as you mentioned, the legislature in 2020 made some pretty significant changes to the film tax credit for the state of Georgia. And what effectively happened after January 1 of 2021, uh, productions became subject to a mandatory audits. And so at the end of the day is, uh, if we were to jump in and conduct mandatory audits on every production that were certified by the Department of Economic Development after January 1st, 2021, uh, we would have had a very, very large load of credits that we would have had to review. And, and we really didn't really have the capacity. And the other aspect was is that um, the larger productions had already previously been through a lot of the audits, either through the department under, under a voluntary basis or through um, private audits. And what we did is uh, in, in, integrated a tiered system that would bring productions under audit as defined by the value of the credit. So in 2021, if your credit was more than 2.5 million, you had to undergo a mandatory audit. In 2022, if your credit was greater than 1.25 million, then you would undergo an audit. And then effective January of this year, the uh, everybody would undergo a mandatory audit, irregardless of what the, um, the value of their credit was. So that helped um, us get into the process of conducting the audits. The productions could understand the process and it wasn't such a monumental change right at that point in time. So it gave everybody the opportunity to become acclimated to the situation. So the other thing that came through the legislative changes was that instead of, um, the, it bifurcated the credits to the 20% credit and to a 10% credit so that once you concluded your mandatory audit, you would get issued a 20% certificate from the Department of Revenue. And then when Department of Economic Development affirmed that the 10% uplift had been earned, earned, you would get a second letter. So the costs are going to be the same for determining the 20% and the 10% uplift. But at the end of the day, it bifurcated where previously uh, it was it was under a different set of rules, and you ended up with kind of one credit, depending upon whether you had the, a twenty percent or a ten percent. The third thing that was important in there is it allowed um, certified auditors, CPA firms, to go through training with the Department of Revenue and become a certified auditor and assist the department in handling what is expected to be a very large number of audits that are gonna be completed, especially starting in 2023 with every production that had to, uh, will undergo an audit. And so th those are the three really significant changes that came out of the legislation in 2021, starting with 2021. Um, the other thing is, is um, you know, we conducted the training for those certified auditors and, you know, talking about the crunch of all the productions having to do it and become familiar with mandatory audits. We had to create a, a whole training program for all those certified auditors so that they could come to understand exactly the depth of what we do when we conduct our audits. 
Um, and so when a production is subject to a mandatory audit, they go through, they incur their expenses, and they're required to come through and apply for their audit within one year of the completion of principal photography. The applications are generally submitted through the Georgia Tax Center. And uh, since we had so many changes that were occurring, uh, we also have a web-based application that is now on our Georgia Department of Revenue's dedicated film tax credits website. Eventually, that website and the, the ability to submit an application through that is going to cease to exist and everything is going to be conducted through the Georgia Tax Center. Um, got it. The other thing that's really, yes, Melissa? No, I just said got it. I was commenting okay. about the Georgia Tax Center, sorry. Okay, so, so the other thing that we did do as part of all this in our website is we created a much more organized and, and readily accessible website that has a lot of useful information. There's a lot of resources out there. It has access to the statutes, the regulations, letter rulings, bulletins, and everything else that could directly affect the productions in order to determine what the qualified costs are. You know, I think I heard today that the, um, the Screen Actors Guild has settled their um, strike with the studios. And one of the questions that has always come up is, is what type of costs are going to qualify that were incurred during this uh, shutdown of the strike. And there is a bulletin that was issued uh, uh, recently by the Department of Revenue that lays forth all those items in there that will continue to qualify during that shutdown period. So uh, there's also coronavirus questions out there. Um, there's a lot of really good information that I really strongly recommend everybody go through take a look at, become familiar with, and then if you have any other questions, you can um, bring those forward to the particular individuals that may be able to handle it. Just because we're an audit doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to be the place to, or the resource to respond to a lot of inquiries. Some of those may be involving our taxpayer services division and other aspects could also involve our legal affairs and tax policy folks. Um, so as far as when we handle things, we handle things really contained within the audit. Interpretation is left up to our legal affairs and tax policy group and, um, compliance is left up to the taxpayer services. So once you, um, bring forward and, and submit your application, the auditor is going to contact you and whether it's a certified auditor you have uh, requested or the Department of Revenue conduct the review, is they're gonna reach out to you and give you a, what we call an information document request or an IDR. And that IDR is gonna list out all the materials they want to be able to examine in order to start the review. And the review is really um, uh, looking at the costs and, and the review, the purpose of the review is really to determine how much of your costs qualify for the credit, not how much is disqualified. So we look at all those costs and pretty much build from the ground up and say, these are the things that are qualified. And what do we look at? Well, we're gonna look obviously at your cost ledger. We're gonna look at the contracts for services provided, whether it's through loan outs, visual effects, um, you know, other types of service providers that could be um, on set for the production or services that are provided offset. Uh, and per the regulations, uh, a production will have 60, 60 days to respond to that document request and provide the information to us. Documentation that is not submitted within 60 days will be excluded from the audit. And then once the audit is completed, you, and there'll be a lot of back and forth, uh, there'll be additional IDRs seeking um, information regarding purchases. There could be some clarification of, you know, what type of services were being conducted on set and, and other types of things. So at the end of the day is, is it's the, the audit process is really going to be upon a, is really dependent upon the response from the productions. So the more prepared you are, 
in advance for these audits, the more you've looked at the materials that are out there on our website for these audits, you are going to have an audit that's going to generally be conducted um, pretty efficiently. And so as you conclude all the IDRs and the information is, is concluded, you, you may not be in agreement with what the auditor has derived as qualified expenses and not qualified expenses. And once that audit is concluded, it is subject to review by different levels at the Department of Revenue. Um, the audit manager will review it. The assistant director of audits will review it. The director of audits could review it. And also the deputy director um, would have access to review these depending upon the size of the credits because we have certain sign-off levels within the department as to the value of credits that can be issued. So once it goes through that process, the production will be issued a 20% final film tax audit. It's called the film tax credit audit final 20% certification letter. So at the end of the day, you're gonna get that. And that presents the productions or the studios, the opportunity if they're in disagreement with the audit results and they think some other items should be qualified that were not allowed, they will have the ability to submit a protest and seek some informal all the way up to formal you can go through the tax tribunal if you want in order to have their issues heard and possibly resolved and that was that's as if any type of protest of any type of notification issued by the department of revenue so you it definitely falls in line with that and all that information is submitted through the georgia tax center um, once the 20% certificate has been issued and Department of Economic Development has notified us that the production has earned the 10% the uplift, then a second letter will be generated and that certificate will be issued automatically through the system. Right now, we are building the functionality in the system so that when economic development tells us, the letter is automatically generated. The 20% letter is generated through the system once the audit is closed by the audit staff and it will be issued. And those letters are all available on the Georgia Tax Center. So once you kind of get notified of that, you should be able to go out to the Georgia Tax Center and see the letters there and the certificates and the value of the credit. And that's about, that's about the process. <laughs> And that was a lot of um, information, but all very informative, Brian. So thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I do find I get the most detailed information you can reference with the Georgia Department of Revenue's audit manual, which is found. Um, Natalie is sharing that slide. It's it's the actual very top link on that uh, reference material when you go to that page. Um, it's very in depth. It's a very enlightening read. Um, so enjoy. Um, you can also find on this page a list of the eligible third party CPA auditors that um, Brian referenced that have been certified. Currently, there are five of them Brower and Company, Co Resnick, Bennett Thrasher, Frazier Veter, and MS Tiller. So those are all um, you know, excellent resources once you engage if those are auditors that you decide to uh, partner with. Um, and you know, what I wanted to do here is start very broad. Right, Brian. So on behalf of your team, what is the biggest advice you can give anyone with a production coming into Georgia? And what is some of the most consistent errors you've come across? Well, the, the first thing I would do before um, as, as, an, as something that should be taken into account is look at all the available reference material. The Department of Economic Development has a lot of really good reference materials out there as does the Department of Revenue. And between those two websites, you should get a pretty, pretty good at, um, um, understanding of how the film tax credit works, what type of items are subject to the film tax credit. Georgia is very unique in, in delineating itself from other states and their film tax credit. So, you know, people may bring to them a certain knowledge of New York or California or Louisiana and um, those rules are a little bit different than, than what we have here in Georgia. So, 
become familiar with that. Don't be too presumptive in, in how the things are going to work. And then at the end of the day is be prepared, you know, take this information that's available out there publicly to you and think about it even as you're going through your production, as your production accounts are doing this, to go through that and understand how the audit's going to be conducted. You know, one of the other things that we do um, is we will participate in pre-production meetings with the uh, production accountants. So if they may have specific questions, uh, it can help them gain an understanding because the more knowledge they have at the beginning, the quicker the audit should go at the end. Right. Knowledge is power, um, <laughs> as we all say. And, I, you know, I think that's great that you're available for these productions. Um, you know, I would just like to piggyback off of what you were saying. You know, here at EP, our department, we want to set our clients up for success from the get-go. You know, so they set up their payroll appropriately. They know the rules. They know, understand why the tagging um, is, is being requested of them and, you know, how um, they should try to set things up for themselves to not make it such a hard process in the end because you don't want those items to come up in audit. You want them to come up ahead of time so that you know how to mitigate those. So, um, and you were talking about, um, you know, when you submit an audit application, right? When you apply for the audit, so that's 12 months after uh, principal photography ends. How are, how are you treating that for post-production? So say a production has post-production cost in Georgia that will qualify. Well, um, the post-production costs are, are a qualified component of the film tax credit. And so when the, 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 the statutes and the regulations require that a production present itself for audit within the 12 months and submit the application. And then once this application is submitted, we will take a look at how the production is structured, how they're working on things, um, you know, and the various aspects, whether it's post-production or reshoots or additional photography, how all those items will take will come into play. And we will discuss those items with the productions. Okay. Um, and, you know, we one of the things that you, you had mentioned in these changes is you know, there's better definition now in that audit manual of a qualified vendor. So can you explain to us about a qualified vendor um, and then, you know, also kind of touch on business licenses? Well, and that's one of the good things about that's out there on our website is there is uh, a lot of information on what is defined as a Georgia vendor. So the first place I would stop is to go there and look at that. And a Georgia vendor has a myriad of, of different qualifications, whether it's a provision of services, a provision of tangible goods. Um, and, and so we take a look at those to determine what is a, a Georgia vendor. And when the statutory changes came in, we attempted to broaden the definition of a Georgia vendor through the use of business licenses and everything else. So, you know, I would look to that reference material. It's hard to discuss what a Georgia vendor is in an overall context term. Um, but, you know, uh, the Georgia vendors are ones that are, you know, obviously have a place of business in Georgia. You can walk in and do all those types of things. And those are the ones that are pretty much the easier ones. Um, with the institution of the business licenses, that became more apparent to the productions as to how they were holding themselves out as a vendor. And yeah. that information was intended to allow the productions to gather this information and allow them to make their business decision. If that was the vendor that they wanted to use, would it qualify for the credit? Yeah, and um, I think there's a lot of information out there. You know, we get this question a lot from our clients when they first start of, okay, well, the the vendors registered with the Secretary of State. Um, okay, that that's good, but a business license is issued from a local, um, you know, municipality. So that's something that I think is important information when we talk about business licenses. 
um, and, you know, where to find those, right? Because so many vendors come back and say, well, you know, we're registered with the Secretary of State. That um, doesn't necessarily get you a business license. So um, you need to make sure of that. Um, I just wanted to clarify that. But say, yeah, and, say yeah. and I'll, Go I'll ahead, add to real quick is, you know, this material is out there for productions. It's also out there for the, for the, mm -hmm. um, Companies that want to provide services to the production, they should be the ones that are looking at this also because if they become familiar with it, they'll be able to look and say, oh, registration with the Secretary of State is not a qualifying activity. Yep. You know, I we had a consulting deal a couple of years ago where a company came to us and said, you know so much about incentives. We want to hire you to tell us what we need in these territories in order to qualify. And I thought it was a brilliant way for a business to take that approach instead of just opening an office and not really knowing what's required, right? Um, so I thought that was very smart of them to do that. But when we talk about the business licenses, so say I bought something, a, a production bought something September of this year, and I get the business license effective in not, say November, or it expired in August. How is that treated when it comes to the audit process? Well, most of the business licenses are either on the, the uh, jurisdiction's physical year or a calendar year basis. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, much like having a sales tax license or conducting business in the state, we expect those businesses to have all of those regulatory um, documentation done before they start business with the production. Yep. And so... You know, there's a lot of productions that started, um, these changes had taken effect, and then, you know, more guidance had come out after they, you know, had started production. So they may not have some of these business licenses. And one of the, the questions we got is, how much grace are we giving uh, to these productions that may not have every business license that, you know, is on file? Well, um the statute became effective, you know, one one twenty one, and the regulations that have all this information became effective. I think, if I remember correctly, March fourteenth of twenty twenty one. So there wasn't really much of a of a time frame in which the information was not available to the productions. So you know, if if they fall within that three month period, we would have to take a look at it and see, you know, uh, the particular fact patterns around those productions and. Okay. the okay. vendors that could be affected and we'd have to take those on a case by case basis. Okay. And when we talk about vendors, let's talk about sales tax registrations. I hear you talk a lot about the Georgia tax center, but where does a production go to obtain these? Where does a production go to obtain a, a registration? Yeah. The sales tax registration. So I think in the context of that is, how does a uh, how does a production verify that their vendors are registered for sales tax and it's a, and it's a valid yeah. certificate? So in, in the context of that, that's where our website is exceptionally uh, beneficial because there is a direct link on our website, on the film tax credit website, that links you into a different section of the DOR website where you can enter a, a myriad of search options in order to determine if that vendor is registered with the state of Georgia for sales tax. Uh, you can do it by federal ID number, you can do it by address, you can do it by name search. There's a, there's a whole bunch of ways to obtain that information. And I, so that's important because we had those websites on the slides that Natalie was sharing earlier. So um, just make sure that that is a good takeaway for everyone and to use that uh, film tax credit resource, right? To your advantage. Um, since we're talking about sales tax, how can a production find out what is and is not taxable in Georgia? In in the context of uh, items that are subject to sales tax, uh, you know, we're in the area of, of film credit audits, and the sales tax area is a completely different area, completely different set of auditors, and they're just like the film tax credit. There are reference materials on the DR website that you can look to to gain an understanding of exactly what items should be 
subject to tax and should not be. And I, I would I would refer them to that area and okay. to look into that. And there's all types of um, sources um, that you can subscribe to that will provide you additional information also. Okay. So uh, moving on to in-state verification forms, how did these work and to whom, what vendors do they apply to? Well, you know, the, the out-of-state verification forms is, is what we're trying to do is to determine the um, component of the services that are actually provided on the ground in Georgia and what are those services comprised of. And so that's all we're really trying to do is get the information out there to the productions in advance so that they can ha assist in making those determinations so that when we come through and review it, we can say, okay, we, uh, we understand this is a visual effects company that's based out of California and they come in and do some previs work on set and then they take it back to their offices in California. And this is to help them gain the documentation in advance in order to get the information so that we can review it and determine if that allocation is appropriate. So we're trying to give the tools to the productions so that as they're engaged actively with these uh, service companies, they can obtain the documentation that we're going to ask for, you know, in a, in a year or additional time after the completion of principal photography that may be hard to go back and obtain at a later date. And does withholding tax have to be performed for those out-of-state vendors to qualify? Well, withholding tax has, has a whole myriad of, of connotations, but anytime an employee for a company is working in Georgia and it meets the, the standards to require Georgia withholding, then yeah, they're gonna have to withhold. Okay. And you know, I've heard that these in-state verifications might even need to be filled out by Georgia vendors. Do you have to prove withholding tax on those as well? It sounds like the answer is probably yes, but I don't want to answer for you. Um, yeah, I mean, everybody has their um, legal obligations to properly um, withhold and remit taxes and pay them, and it would fall in line with that. Okay. So I would like to kind of shift from the vendor focus to everyone's favorite topic, the loan out allocations and producer narratives. Um, how are you assessing it? And, and is the DOR considering reevaluating this process at all? Well, the process is mandated by regulations and everything else. So yep. from an audit standpoint is, is we follow the guidance that's out there. So I couldn't speak to that aspect of, you know, are we reconsidering that would be more, uh, in the in the realm of our legal affairs group, um, right. but you know what we're looking for is especially when you have your above the line actors and directors and producers that could be conducting services um, in and out of state. We're just trying to be able to quantify those amounts and make sure the allocations are appropriate. Okay, and so the, a lot of questions have come up whether you have someone, uh, say you have a loan out that's making less than 300000 and they only worked in Georgia, but they traveled out of state into Georgia. So say they flew from New York to Georgia. Uh, does that trigger a loan out allocation form? Yeah. It, it, when you, even though your um, uh, loan out may be working 100% in Georgia, is they are, you know, destined for Georgia as part of their contractual requirements. And so statutorily, it says uh, basically half day each way um, is, uh, is for allocation for those people there traveling to Georgia for the purpose of a, of a trip. So at the end of the day, you get a half day in and a half day out. So one day allocation is always going to be required. Okay. Um, and so you had mentioned earlier, um, well, I, before I move on, I want to talk about the producer daily narrative. So how is that, how have you seen in most recent reviews or audits that have come up, um, you know, with these changes and having to provide that is, um, is there guidance of what you're looking for? 
you know, what they can provide. It's, it, you know, it's easier for cast members or directors to figure out where they are at any given time. Producers, it's a bit different. Well, you know, the one thing that is set forth in, in the guidelines, the regulations and everything else is that, um, you know, is that producers are, you know, are, are loan out and everything else. And, you know, we're required to determine what type of services are qualified. Producers could also be involved in non-qualified services. It could be publicity. The actors are the same way, publicity and promotion. So as part of that, that's what we're looking for is those types of activities are non-qualified and to make sure that we can take those into account when we're trying to determine the value of the services that are qualified as they work in Georgia. And at the end of the day is, is that information and you know, what's required is, is a component of the information that is on our website. And you have producers, uh, you have directors, you can have a director operating under a, a 261010 rule. And you know, we're, we're going to look to see are they on the production reports? You know, are these folks, you know, that are providing these services on the production reports? That's one of the things that's mandated out there is if you're performing services on set, you have to be on the production report. And then if you're on the production report and you, you have a myriad of hats you wear as a producer, as a director, maybe a script writer and all those types of things is we want to gain an understanding to make sure that those services are provided fall within the guidelines of the uh, uh, the film tax credit. Okay. And you had mentioned earlier, um, actually you said, I think you said um, SAG has reached an agreement. I have not heard that yet. Did you mean writers? Oh, I'm sorry. It's a writer. You're right. Okay, good. Because I was yeah. just thinking, I don't want to shift the webinar to start talk, but I do. Yeah. Um, I was about to say, I don't have my Google alerts set up right if that has happened, but let's, let's fast forward past the WGA and SAG strike. Um, guild agreements are in place. You know, there is that bulletin that you mentioned um, that is on that film tax resource site that kind of, that will go over costs that qualify. But how are hiatus costs treated for say a holiday break or a, a break that the production needs to take? A lot of productions like to hold rental cars or if they have housing that they have um, for a considerable amount of time. So how, how does the Department of Revenue treat those costs? So those costs we look at, those are all kind of considered uh, in various aspects, almost as dark period cost. And when those occur is, is um, I don't have the bulletin in front of me, but the bulletin addresses the specifics of the items that will qualify. So okay. I would refer them over to those two bulletins to take a look at. And then if they have additional questions after reading the bulletin, then they could come forward and with the specific spe specific inquiry to which they're talking about, whether it's um, you know rental cars or stage space or whatever else it may be. Mm -hmm. And um, going back to the audit application that you mentioned, I know it there is a web based version, but everything's going to be moved towards the Georgia Tax Center, so you're going to have to log into your account to apply for the audit. Is that correct? That is correct. Um, so when you go into the account and, and the Georgia Tax Center is really not under the um, responsibility of audits. So I only kind of see demonstrations of what occurs out there. And, and if there's specific information that may not be flowing through the portal to us, I will request, you know, maybe some changes to the form to, you know, include uh, a parent reporting number or something along those lines. But everything that kind of occurs through the porter, portal, all that information is provided is basically filtered and, and we get a notification that that application has arrived. And then secondly is once the audit fee has been remitted, we'll get a notification that the audit fee has been remitted. And so when those two items occur, then the audit begins. And that's when the timer really begins on everything. So okay. if you submit your application and then don't submit an audit fee for three months, your timer starts in three months, not the day you submit the audit application. Okay. And I, you know, one comment I would like to make, you had mentioned about the IDR 
um, the document requests. So there's two versions of those. There's a, a, a first round and then a second round. And I just want to warn productions when we talk about setting you up for success, it's important to have everything lined up before you go into audit. Because once that IBR is triggered, you have to come up with that information 60 days. So it's really important to have good advisors, people that can hold your hand through the process and make sure everything's as clean as possible, right? Um, so but let's talk about this. What if you are a production? I know everyone now is under a mandatory audit, right? But if you are a production that didn't have a mandatory audit, but you still elected to go through the Department of Revenue anyway, do they still need to register their tax credits on the Georgia Tax Center site? Well, the, the things with those credits is, is the audit group only handles uh, productions that are under audit. You know, those ones that are not under a mandatory audit, those are more of a compliance issue. And that's not really within what our group does. We, we're the ones that do the audit. So it would be those type of questions would probably be better directed at somebody that uh, is familiar with how that occurs. We only present, we only deal with audits that are presented to us. Okay. So, but if it, it's not required to be a mandatory audit, but they went, they elected to have a department of revenue audit. When you issue your audit letter, is this tax certificate issued in with that? So, you know, we, when we do our audits and mm -hmm. we're doing the mandatory audits, there is a specific letter that's issued. It says final audit um, right. for 20% or the 10%. But those other um, ones, whether they even go through a voluntary audit with us is, is what you were alluding to, I believe. Yes. If they were to go yes. through a voluntary audit, um, we issue our audit findings. And But as far as the issuance of the certificates and everything else, that is basically triggered uh, in the same fashion as it was occurred prior to 2021. The okay. Department of Audits don't have anything to do with that. We uh, will send the information over to compliance and compliance will still make sure that the information that is submitted on their tax returns lines up with what the voluntary audits results were. And then anything that occurs after that is really in the compliance arena and not in okay. our audit. Got it. Okay, so let's talk about reporting parents and how critical this piece is. It is not new, but it is a concept that throws so many production people off when trying to transfer the credit at the end. So can you speak to how your tax credit should be structured? Well, <clears throat> it's it's really a, a pretty complex matter for for most productions to and studios to incur. And, and once again, that's a compliance issue. That's not really in the audit realm, but you know, from, from what we're familiar with is the film tax credits are not generated on a disregarded entity, which is most what the LLCs are. So it's very important and it's very critical that the compliance aspect of those line up to the reporting parent. And if they're having issues with that, they really need to talk to the taxpayer services division. Uh, that's not, you know, we don't know how to move those things around. And as I said, at the end of the day, we're just auditing the numbers and issuing the results. As far as the compliance aspect of that, that really belongs in, in an area that we really are not familiar with. And so um, did, I'm trying to remember, Brian, if we, if there was an, can they send it to the tax credit inquiries um, email address if they have a question about that? Yes, that there is. Um, yeah. Yes. So there's a tax credits inquiries. Um, and then we also, in the film audits, have a, um, oh, thank you, a website, not a website, but an email address. Yeah, those are right there. Email yeah. address so that if they have an inquiry that they cannot find through reference materials, then they can send it to that and we uh, will respond uh, with whatever information we can provide. Sometimes we might just provide a link to the reference materials and say it's contained within this and, and find it out because people tend to come to us with questions that have already been answered on the website and we right. want them to get used to going to that website. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. And thank you for pulling that up, Natalie. That's great. Um, so tax year, again, a concept that is hard for many productions to grasp. But um, let's say the production entity earning the credit is on a tax year of 930. And let's say their production started in August and will continue filming until October. So under these new rules, how many, I feel like this is a riddle for you, Brian, how okay. many audit letters and certificates will the production get? Well, the way the, the um, audit process works right now is, is we conduct the audit and we issue the, uh, the film tax audit letters at the conclusion. And once those audits are concluded and you receive your 20% letter, you will have three years for that credit to be valid from that point. Um, and you will you receive the 10% uplift as, as approved by Department of Economic Development. And so, you know, those areas of, you know, physical year end versus calendar year end and everything else, once again, that's really on the compliance side. And I'm in audits for a reason. I'm not really that familiar with the compliance aspects. It had to be directed to them. Yeah. But one thing I do want to talk about when it comes to this tax year um, issue, if you do have, so just think about your tax year. If you do have the costs that are going to qualify that spill over into another tax year, you know, the initial certification is really the piece that needs to be driven too. And that's an economic and development, um, the film office function, right? And I, Allison Tibbon and her team are great. So um, what has, one of the things that they've implemented is, you know, you have to have proper documentation if you have costs that spill into another tax year. And if you, you know, provide the proper documentation, then their office can issue what's called an annual certificate to get you covered for the additional tax year. What I've always loved about the Georgia program, and it's um, rare really on the, the U.S. side of incentives, is that um, Georgia is relatively quick to initially certify your project. So Allison and her team have up to 60 days to issue an initial certification for a production um, however, they usually strive for seven to 14 days. Um, and that's usually the turnaround time that we're seeing for our clients. But again, it's all contingent on how well the package is put together for our office. And if you have all the particulars there and they can act fast. But that's one thing that I've always loved about the Georgia program is how fast the film office works and getting those initial certifications out. Um, I know we're getting close to time, um, but one of the things... I wanted to go back to and make sure that we address is, you know, we know the audit letter will come from the auditor assigned, but, you know, who does a production go to for these certificates that um, come with the audit letter? Does it come as a package? If you get your audit letter, you'll get the Georgia certificate along with it from that perspective. Yeah, that's one of the, the really uh, good changes that have kind of come out of this. So, as I mentioned previously, is is the audit's going to be conducted, and if the production is in agreement or, or has disagreements with the audit results, what we're going to do is we're going to issue them that film tax credit twenty percent letter, and that letter is going to say this is the this is the name of the production, and it's going to refer to Department of Economic Development certificate number, and it's going to say you know we the department is certified. X dollars of, um, of cost were qualified and your 20% credit is Y and here is your certificate number so that all that information is going to be contained on that single letter that is issued upon completion of the audit. And once that letter is generated, you can go into the Georgia Tax Center from what my understanding and they have a listing of all the certificates that are available for a production. So um, I haven't really seen it from the Georgia side. I only really see it from our integrated tax solutions side. Yeah. And uh, so I know that once that letter is generated, it's normally generated with about a, a, a couple day um, delay. So if, if the, letter was issued on October 5th, 1st, you may have like an October 5th date on it. And that's just to allow it time to, to get to the taxpayers in the mail. So they will have a full 30 days 
in order to protest everything. And on that letter, it will have um, the ability and, and instructions on how to protest it. And it will also have a, a copy of the taxpayer bill rights. Okay. Then I'm assuming when you um, talk about a protest, it, it would hold, hold up the entire credit, right? If you're not going to certify part of the credit and then have a bucket of costs that are being protested. Is that correct? That's correct. So if you are in disagreement, whether it's a dollar or a hundred dollars or a million dollars is once the 20% letter is issued, then that credit will be available from that amount. And then if you uh, are successful in a protest, um, or, you know, through the tax tribunal, then, you know, that additional credit will become available to the productions. Okay. And going back to talking about the certificates and the issuance of them, so the 10% certificate will still come from your office, but everything has to be routed through the film office. Is that correct? Well, so the film office is, is what originates everything in this film tax credit, right? They, they, um, they certify the productions, and then at the end, if the production wants the 10% uplift, I believe there is certain materials they are required to provide to the Department of Economic Development in order to validate that they met the qualifying requirements for the 10% uplift. And then what they'll do is they'll notify the Department of Revenue of the productions uh, during a time frame that have met the qualification requirements and that information is basically fed into the integrated tax system and the letters will be automatically produced. It'll be matched up with the DECD certificate number and say, OK, they've made their 10 percent and the letter will come out automatically. OK. And that since we're talking about the film office, I do want to mention. So there is a distribution form that, again, is on um, the website where you look at the resources on the film office website. Um, and that's really um, the biggest piece of the of the 10 percent, along with other deliverables. And when we're talking about deliverables, you know, we offered up those two email addresses for the film office contacts. There's a project checklist. So when you get initially certified, Allison's team is also going to accompany those certificates with a project checklist that says, you know, offers up what goes where to those two um, email addresses that we provided. And what I just want to reiterate to everybody is make sure when you get those initial certifications, because it's only going to go to the person that's on the actual application. So when they receive it, share that checklist with your production accountant, with, you know, the EP incentives, if you've hired us to be your advisor, make sure people have those listings so they, uh, you know, understand what, what they need. Um, and I know we, we've only got about four minutes left, so I just want to um, turn it back over to Natalie to see if there were any questions. Before I do, Brian, was there any other comments you wanted to make before we take a, a few questions? Or a few um, questions, I guess. In no, your I, you know, as I, as I as I discussed, is is just be prepared, right? Have as have become as familiar as you can with how the film tax credit works. At the end of the day, you know, it's production accountants that are trying to gain an understanding of how some of the film tax credit rules and regulations will work. But, um, you know, to the extent they need help, seek it out and, and, uh, and make sure that you understand the process. So at the end of the day, the audits will be go some much quicker and be less frustrating. Yes, we like less frustrating. So Natalie? <laughs> Hello, thank you to everyone who submitted questions. We've received quite a few. Uh, since we are running short on time, we will just address a couple. So Brian, I'm gonna start with a couple for you about the incentive. Um, does the incentive apply to animation and does it apply to televised events? For example, um, a live event, a live musical event, anything of that nature? Well, once again, a lot of that information is out there in the in the documentation and and you know questions you know I if I were to see receive that type of question there would be a bunch of follow-ups questions I would have is you know what exactly are we talking about in animation what are we talking about in live events and and those are the those are the types of things that would probably be best answered through uh, a follow-up question that could be submitted to either a legal affairs group or through our 
email address. All right. When it comes to meeting um, the minimum spend requirements, can an indie production that may be coming in below that 500000 threshold um, do any sort of combinations within a multi-year period to qualify? Um, if you have productions within the same production company, within the same legal entity, um, uh, one is, is you have to work closely with the Department of Economic Development in getting those projects certified. And then secondly is once they do get certified, you're allowed to aggregate them, but you can only aggregate them within one tax year. So if you're having productions that cross multiple tax years, uh, statutorily you're not allowed to aggregate those. All right, thank you. Melissa, I'm gonna head over to you um, and wrap up with this as our last question because we are at the at the end of our time. Um, what advice do you have for beginners um, who may be working in the industry for the first time, dealing with incentives for the first time? Um, any, any tips for those who are newer to all of this information? Yeah, you know, it's, it's so hard because there's um, a lot of information to take in, right? So just know your information. Try to educate yourself. Go to our website. You can hire us to help you. And, you know, we always like to say we're the bookends to the tax credits. We'll hold your hand through the process. If you can't afford us to hold your hands through the entire process, just hire us uh, for a smaller fee to maybe set you up for success so that you don't have the pitfalls at the end and try to mitigate the risk. But education and hiring the right people are just critical, you know, when you're when you're getting started with a project. And before I hand it back over to Natalie, I just want to say a big thank you to Natalie Nelson. She produces all of our webinars. She makes us look great. She keeps us on point. She keeps us on task. So I just so appreciate all you've done for the master series and making us um, look better than we probably are. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Melissa. It is always a pleasure uh, for every one of these webinars, um, the wonderful panelists and our wonderful audience who keep returning. So thank you, uh, Melissa and Brian. And again, to our audience for joining us today. Uh, we're just going to wrap up, wrap up quickly uh, before we end our webinar. So we got a lot of questions today about how to access the information we were discussing today. Is a recording going to be sent out? And we do send out recordings to everyone who registers. But if you would like to head over to ep.com slash master series, you can find our entire library of webinars. This includes industry and product news, production incentives, financing topics, payroll and payroll tax, and legislation changes and legal and compliance topics as well. We've been doing these since 2020. We have 100 and more up <laughs> on the site. So we would love it if you could check those out. We also want to let you know that, as Melissa mentioned, ep.com slash production incentives is your go-to resource to find the latest in production incentives information. We have some wonderful tools that you can use, our jurisdiction comparison tool, an incentives estimator. You can also get in touch with the incentives team. So we encourage you, if you are looking for incentives help in North America, the UK, Australia, we have a lot of information right at your fingertips. So please visit us at ep.com slash production incentives. Thank you again to everyone who joined us today. And thank you, Brian, for this hard-hitting Q&A. Um, it is wonderful to hear from the Georgia Department of Revenue. And thank you, Melissa, for leading a wonderful conversation. Everyone, we hope to see you at our next episode of the Master Series. Oh.